Uh, and this meeting is being recorded right now. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Nina Mazmat. I'm operations coordinator at EDGE and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's workshop on operationalizing SDGs for your social venture led by the amazing Alicia, who I would be introducing in a bit. Uh, but before that, we would like to thank RBC Future Launch for funding this opportunity and this workshop today. Before I share more about EDGE and introduce our amazing, amazing facilitator, I'd like to start with acknowledging that the land on which we gather has been and still is the traditional territory of several indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, the Métis, and the Mississaugas of the Craig First Nation. Since time immemorial, numerous indigenous nations and indigenous peoples have lived and passed through this territory. We recognize this territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and the Two Row Wampum Treaty, which emphasizes the importance of joint stewardship, peace, and respectful relationships. Sheridan and Edge both affirm that it is our collective responsibility to honor and respect those who have gone before us, those who are here, and those who have yet to come. We're grateful for the opportunity to work and live on this land. For anyone who might not know or might not be familiar with EDGE, EDGE is where impact and entrepreneurship thrive. We support a vibrant community of change makers and entrepreneurs who want to create a more equitable and just society. In collaboration with our partners, EDGE provides founders with mentorship, learning programs, co-working space when we're not in the pandemic, um, and support to access funding. If you're interested in joining our community as a member, please check out our website at edge.sheridancollege.ca or connect with one of our EDGE staff through the session. That would be Omar, me, and Noreen. Um, and Omar would be pasting links to our website and different resources throughout the, throughout the workshop. So don't worry about missing anything. To give you a brief background or to give you a couple of numbers on what we have done so far since our launch in 2018, EDGE has supported 303 founders who collectively built 257 ventures. These ventures have created 650 jobs and raised more than $8.4 million in sales and investments. 70% of our current ventures identify social enterprises and 70% are led by underrepresented founders. Throughout these years, we have engaged over 11,000 program participants through different programming. At EDGE, we support entrepreneurs at different stages of their journey for shared in students that are trying to explore um, entrepreneurship. We support them through our Explore program uh, and provide assistance through that. Uh, we have cohort-based programs for early stage impact entrepreneurs exploring and validating their ideas through our LEAP program. Within the same kind of model, we provide support to early stage impact ventures led by young entrepreneurs, uh, particularly between the age of 15 and 29 through our social impact catalyst program powered by RBC Future Launch. Um, we also have an exciting RISE program that offers intensive coaching and mentoring for ventures who have demonstrated traction. We will be sharing links to our program page on our website. Uh, by the end of this session, we recently closed our applications for our programs, but keep an eye out in a month or two, we'll be opening program applications again. A few reminders for today, kindly remain mute um, can you remain on mute during the session? If possible, turn on your camera. We understand that you might not be able to do that all the time or not everyone might be able to do that. But if you can, we'd really appreciate it because it builds a sense of community. Um, the session has live closed captions. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat. If you face any technical difficulties, please send a message to Neelam, that is me or Omar, who's my colleague, um, and both of us are on this call. The session is being recorded, so be cognizant of that. What that also means is that in the follow-up email that we'll be sending out after this session, we will be sending a recording of this session. 
Um, and again, do not worry if you miss anything. We'll be posting links and information in the chat. We'll also be sending a follow-up email that will have access to all of the resources. Now, coming to our facilitator of the day, Alicia. Alicia is a sustainability and social impact consultant based in Toronto and a fierce advocate of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with extensive experience in international development, nonprofits, and community organizations. She works with forward-thinking organizations to assess, amplify, and embed their desired social and environmental impact, especially using the UN SDGs as a guiding framework. As the Partnerships and Standards Manager at the Common Approach to Impact Measurement, Alicia leads the development and adoption of the Common Approach by Social Purpose purpose organizations across Canada. She's currently the Director of Programming for Leading Change Canada and an organization focused on activating youth sustainability leadership for the transition to a low carbon economy within a generation. She is a proud dual citizen of Trinidad and Tobago and Canada. She holds a master's in environmental studies, planning concentration, and a BA in economics and social sciences, both from the York University. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass the virtual mic to Alicia. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it on to Alicia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Neelam. Let me get my screen share going here. Okay, good evening, afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, I just dropped the link in the chat to a workbook. So it's a fillable PDF that you can use to, you know, go through the activities with me here today. And I hope that you're able to access that and go through it. So it really get into, you know, some of the questions and challenges so I can answer those and help you through the work that we do today. But I'm really excited uh, to talk today about planning for impact with the SDGs, right? So how do we operationalize the sustainable development goals as social ventures and enterprises? Um, I just want to essentially mirror EDGE's uh, land acknowledgement. I'm also here in downtown Toronto, which has been the traditional territory of many nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Huron, the Wendat, and the Chippewa people, and it's Métis and Inuit people from across Turtle Island. I myself come to Toronto via Trinidad and Tobago, which is the traditional territory of the Carib and Arawak Tainos and the Warao peoples after my own indigenous African ancestors were displaced from their own traditional lands and forcibly settled on these lands that we now call the Americas. Because at the end of the day, north of us, south of us, east of us and west of us is and always will be indigenous land. Um, I really don't want to get too much into myself. Um, I'm just really excited to work with you folks today. Um, like Neela mentioned, I'm an ecological economist by trade who is like deeply invested in understanding how all of our global, social, environmental, and economic systems interact with each other. And I've really latched on to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which I'll get into in a second, just because I feel like they really mirror that reality of the way that all of our issues and challenges are interconnected. Um, and so I've become an advocate and champion of this thing. I'm trying to really help organizations, um, businesses, ventures, you know, leaders like yourselves with how to really translate this global framework down to the local level, right? So we have these, this big thing, it's all global, which can be kind of scary. How do I make sense of it for me in my own context? Um, so before we get into it, um, we will be using Slido. Um, so you can download the app on your phone if you don't have it already. Otherwise, a web browser is fine. It's literally sli.do. Um, and we're gonna test it out in a second. Um, like Neela mentioned, please mute when you're not talking, but if you do want to talk, please feel free to unmute. I welcome, you know, your vocal inputs, turn on your camera if you feel comfortable with that. Um, stop me at any time if you have any questions or comments. Otherwise, also feel free to put your questions in the chat. I have budgeted some time for Q&A. 
um, toward the end. We will have a break around 6.30. I know three hours is a lot of time, so don't worry, the break will be coming in. Um, and like I mentioned before, there is a link to the chat for the workbook. If you don't see it, please um, let Neela and or Omar know and they will send you that link. So to test Slido, um, does everyone see the Slido screen? Um, you can join at slido.com or I said sli.do. Um, you can enter this event code. If you have the app, you can simply put the code in on your app. And so the first question to test this out is an energy check. How is everyone doing today? I know it's Tuesday, but it feels like Monday after this long weekend. How are we doing? Okay, two responses so far. I'll wait for a couple more. Okay, I'm glad that we have a healthy crew here. Nobody's buzzing from caffeine. I know a lot of people like to have, you know, that end of day cup of coffee, which I, I don't personally practice. Um, but that's great. That's great. Okay, so everyone seems to be getting into it well. All right, so that's enough Slido for now. We will get back to the slides. So for today's session, um, these are the topics we're gonna be going over. So really understanding what are the sustainable development goals? How can we explore the opportunities for impact within your own enterprise or venture? How do we get from goals to targets to indicators that make sense for you? How does this all fit into some bigger impact measurement practice? And how do we really integrate sustainability into everything that we do um, through some reflections? Uh, so like I mentioned, if there will be a break, please interrupt me at any time, don't be shy, um, and let's have some fun. So with your reaction buttons, who can, who is familiar with the sustainable development goals? Okay, I see a thumbs up, I see a heart. Has anyone else ever heard of them? All right, so the Sustainable Development Goals were launched back in 2015 by the United Nations, and they really represent um, the effort for the global community to come together around sustainable development. You know, uh, before the Sustainable Development Goals, there were the Millennium Development Goals that ran from the year 2000 to 2015. Um, those had eight big goals, really focused, however, on the developing on the developing world or the global South, the previously colonized. However, we want to categorize them. It was it was focused on those countries in which you know things like poverty and hunger were are such rampant challenges. Not to say that they aren't challenges in countries like Canada too. So the Sustainable Development Goals, which were launched in 2015, and they have a 2030 deadline, really embody this this understanding of us sharing this planet together. The fact that you know, as I said, in Canada, poverty is also a problem here. Hunger is also a problem here. We still have in 2021, indigenous communities with no access to clean drinking water. So all of these issues that, that you know, have typically been understood as this kind of developing world problem are finally being recognized as an issue for everyone to think about. While we also face this impending challenge of climate change, how do we adapt to it? How do we build communities and cities that are able to not just mitigate it, hopefully, but also adapt while building in equity, while reducing inequalities, while championing gender equality, right? Like there's so many different challenges we have. And that's why, you know, as it's often criticized, I think it's really important part of the SDGs of just having these 17 goals. So they define the global sustainable development priorities to mobilize a global community uh, for worldwide action against poverty and hunger to create, you know, like I mentioned, gender equality, affordable energy, climate action, 
sustainable ecosystems and also economic prosperity for us all. And the way they work um, is like this. So there are 17 goals with 69 targets and 231 um, individual indicators. So this is the example from goal one, which in its full language is to end poverty in all its forms anywhere. Uh, goal one has, I think, six targets. So this is just target one. Uh, by 2030, eradicate extreme poverty for all people. That's measured as people living on less than $1.25 a day. And then for goal one, there are also 10 indicators. And the indicator for this target is the proportion of the population that's living below the international, international poverty line by sex, age, employment status, and geographic inclusion. So it really takes us down from the big vision to a specific actionable goal and an indicator to map that, right? And so what we're going to be doing today is looking at these big picture goals and developing targets related to those goals that are specific to your own social ventures and enterprises. And from there, we'll be able to come up with indicators that make sense for you, because the international poverty line is kind of irrelevant to Canada when we have such a high level of um, a high living standard, right? So why should you even be concerned about the SDGs? You know, what is the business case for social ventures? Um, frankly, you know, I think it starts from a community perspective. Um, here on the right hand side is from a Deloitte poll from a couple of years ago of just you know, increasing, increasingly the general population really wants enterprises to be improving society, to be doing good, to be reducing emissions, to not have you know, negative consequences on the environment or on the communities in which they operate. Um, like, we're going, like we're talking today, the goals of a, a framework for strategic planning. How do you set goals for the impact in your organization? How do you really organize yourself around that? And how do you hold yourself accountable to those goals and that impact you want to make? But when we want to get to the more, you know, those, those business case pieces, you know, we're looking at the cost savings, the access to new markets, uh, getting ahead of regulation. Because at the end of the day, as this is a global framework, it means that national governments are also going to be invested in making these shifts, right? So even if all of these things aren't regulation today, they will be regulation soon. And it's, you know, it's in your best interest to make sure that you're ahead of the curve in that way. Um, so here we have a bunch of other um, opportunities around the business case. Companies can use the SDGs really as an overarching framework that helps you to shape, steer, and communicate and report on your strategy, your goals, your activities, and allows you to capitalize on a range of benefits. So in addition to these here, you know, identifying future business opportunities, enhancing the value of corporate sustainability, strengthening stakeholder and community relationships, mobilizing society and markets. And what to me is the most important, which is at the bottom of the slide, is having a common language and a shared purpose. I just think it's so inspirational to know that we're working towards something together as a global community, that you're able to tap into this bigger conversation and you're not just you know, on your own trying to figure this out. Um, but in terms of the numbers, again, here from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, you know, the SDGs provide a $12 trillion uh, USD in market opportunities by 2030 and $380 million across food and agriculture. So that's everything from waste reduction, um, to, to food sustainability practices, cities, uh, transportation, infrastructure, and en energy and materials, health and well being, which is increasingly relevant now that we're going through a pandemic, right? So, as I said earlier, I've been really inspired by this global framework around the sustainable development goals, which which is designed in a way to tap into the national level. So the, for the federal government, to really be able to report in what's called a voluntary national review every couple of years about how well Canada is doing. But how the heck is the government of Canada supposed to know really how well Canada is doing if groundbreaking, you know, impactful organizations just like yourselves don't really know how to fully express that impact and it's not really being captured through data anyway to get up there, right? So the local efforts are really what is key to actualizing the SDGs. It's, it's people like you doing great work, making a difference in your communities. That's actually what the, is actually, you know, who is pushing forward for the SDGs to get achieved. 
And so I'm really, you know, inspired to support folks at the local level to make sense of this framework, to use it and utilize it to their advantage, um, whether that is, you know, clarity in your impact, um, access to better funding opportunities, um, deeper connections with community as well. And so here we have them, the 17 SDGs, um, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being. While I rattle them all off, I want to invite you all to go to the annotate function. So if you go to the, uh, the top of the three dots, you should be able to find the annotate function and then choose a stamp and put some stamps around the SDGs that you think are most relevant for your business. All right, so I can put a stamp here for climate action. All right, I see one here for decent work and economic growth, absolutely. Reduced inequalities, great. Quality education, absolutely. Any others? I mean, I feel like I see a lot of, you know, women entrepreneurs in the participants room here. I feel like, you know, you're kind of you're kind of missing an opportunity with SDG5 here. Oh, are people still um, struggling with the annotate function? Um, Neelam, how are you seeing it on your end? Because on my screen, it's just showing up right there on the, the control bar. So mine isn't showing it either. I'm oh. trying to look for it. Uh, but in the meanwhile, if you can put it in the chat, which SDGs you align with more while I, oh, it's in options. Yeah, it's an options or the three dots. You should be able to find it somewhere there. Evelyn, oh, if you want to come off mic and let us know, because I see you in there too. Yeah, it's okay. Evelyn for Prime Minister. <laughs> we love her. <laughs> if you go to the top middle, you would see view options. And if you click on that, you would see annotate. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Thank you, Evelyn. And then when you get to annotate, just go to stamp and then just drop a stamp on the screen. Okay, I'll give like 30 more seconds so people can fill these out. Okay, I see a couple more in sustainable cities and communities. No poverty, gender equality. Affordable and clean energy. Yeah, this is a pretty great spread here. Okay, thank you so much. And now through the workshop, we're going to see whether or not you think of some new ones that you haven't thought of right now, or fewer ones, or, you know, we'll see, we'll see how, how your understanding of these develop. So I'm just going to clear so that we can move on without scribbles on the next page. So as much as I love the SDGs, there are limitations. Um, the first one I'd like to bring up is around indigenous, indigenous knowledge and reconciliation, right? Um, so historically, I think as a global community, frankly, we need to do better in our indigenous relations and the amount of deep, thoughtful engagement we put into building relationships, building trust, um, working toward reconciliation with indigenous communities. And so the UN has the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is linked in the resource section in the handbook that you can check out. Um, and so, and also in Canada, you probably know of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Calls to Action. 
And so there's still a lot of work we have to do. And with the SDGs, I feel like they did lose an opportunity to really get into that deep engagement. The UN will definitely claim they did a lot, um, but the indigenous people were mentioned like five times across this whole framework of 17 goals, 69 targets, and 231 indicators. Um, and then furthermore, there are some discrepancies with indigenous worldviews, um, which is a discrepancy I share <laughs> that I'll get into in a second of just, you know, if we claim to be honoring and collaborating with indigenous communities, then the spirit of the work that we're doing also has to be in line with those worldviews. Right, so like I mentioned, there's the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Um, and the 94 calls to action came out just a few years ago. And there were a few that focus specifically on businesses. Oh yes, here it is. So number 92 here, I'm um, really looking at the corporate sector and Canadian businesses. And so in your workbook, um, you should have a page here really looking at this part of it. And I'd like you to really look into it, click the link and go to the TRC calls to action to check out the others, but just like quickly reflect on what is the role of reconciliation for your enterprise? How do you engage and connect with indigenous communities? How do you make use of resources from indigenous communities, right? So I think it's really great to draft up an enterprise land acknowledgement as a first step, but then also think about the resources, right? Um, think about the the hydroelectric power that powers a lot of our um, electronics and internet that comes from lakes and waters that were stewarded by indigenous communities for millennia. Um, think about whatever other, if you're a product focused business, what are those like resources that you use for your business, whether it's the actual product or the packaging um, that's really you know, coming out of indigenous communities. How much, how much of that has been really taken account, taken account of? How much of that has been thought through? How much can we do better to think about where things are coming from? Not just how well are people being compensated, but how much are we really consulting with those indigenous communities? And then in this, um, this call to action here, number 92, is really looking at the access to jobs and training. So I'm not sure at what point you are in your enterprise, if you have a bunch of you know, staff, or team members, but thinking about, you know, what would it take to really have diverse representation on that staff, but deep, more deeper than that, to have indigenous representation on that staff. Um, what, what communities are you not yet really consulting with and talking to? I'm going to stop babbling so much and give you a couple of seconds to fill that out in the, in the workbook. Please let us know if you don't have the link. I know it disappears every few minutes whenever someone new is joining. And if you'd like to share some of your reflections in the chat, please feel free to do so, but don't feel like you have to, you know? Because I know a lot of this can be really personal. Um, you know, I really want you to feel called in and not called out. Um, really just kind of reflect and do your homework. I put all the links in the workbook so you can sit and work on this yourself. And I have a comment here from Noreen. I would add that the activities are never done. They're ongoing and that's the way we'll see change in movement. Absolutely, it really has to be part of our everyday, right? So it's like, it's great to have like a nice land acknowledgement, but then how do you take it further? How do you make it more personal? How do you think about, think about your own story? I mean, this is not that kind of workshop, but you know, like it, it can really tie into your business of thinking about how do you personally, how have you personally come to this land? And what is your relationship with this land? And then what is your businesses? What is your enterprise's relationship to the land? How do you benefit from it? How do you take care of it? How do you honor those who have taken care of it before you? And then how do we do this over time? Um, it's, it's really a journey. It's really a deep uh, relationship building process.
Okay. And then as an ecological economist, my other big problem with the SDGs is right here in goal number eight. You know, decent work, I think is fantastic. It's phenomenal. It's great. We definitely need decent work for everybody. But economic growth, um, not so much, right? I think we live in a we live in a time and an economic paradigm that tells us that you know our our number one economic goal should be growth, should be gr growing the GDP. Um, but the fact is that the the increased growth of the GDP requires extraction of resources. It requires environmental degradation, and this SDG is tries to decouple economic growth from environmental degradation, which means trying to find technological ways and processes in order to continue to extract without impacting the environment. But that's impossible. You know, everything that we do is part of the environment. Um, as an eco eco ecological economist, you know, like, I think I have a slide on this in a, in a couple seconds, but, um, you know, we need to think of like this biosphere that we live in with this very, very real biophysical limits of the planet. You know, there's only so much nitrogen that the planet can handle at a certain amount of time. There's only so much carbon that the planet can sustainably handle while maintaining, you know, the conditions for our stable livelihoods. So the more that we, you know, throw that out of whack, the more that the planet is going to try to do things to undo what we're doing. So, you know, I don't know how many people here took, took any economics classes before, but in the past, I would say the past decade, while economies are growing, they're growing at slower paces. Economic growth is declining. And that is literally the planet forcing the contraction of our global economies. And that's what's going to continue to happen by force if we don't change the way we do things. And there's this concept of a carbon budget, right? So there's only so much carbon that the atmosphere can handle and process. And so each country needs to get their fair share of the use of that carbon. And unfortunately, historically, countries like Canada and the Western world have used up a lot of that carbon already. And now we have other emerging and developing countries who kind of want some use of that carbon so they could reach you know, these levels of um, standards of living for their populations, but there's no more carbon left to do that without putting us all in danger. And so we have this concept of Earth Overshoot Day, which um, marks the day, at, the day at which we have used up all of the Earth's resources um, when our demand for ecological resources and services in the year exceeds what the Earth is able to regenerate in that year. And Earth Overshoot Day was just last Friday, the 29th, no, sorry, Thursday. Um, and you can see on the graph on the right hand side here that Earth Overshoot Day is coming up earlier and earlier and earlier in the year. And in fact, if we look at Canada alone, Earth Over Canada Overshoot Day was March 14. Canada Overshoot Day was like less than three months. We already used up everything that the Earth could possibly regenerate for us in a year. And so I think that as Canadians or as settlers in Turtle Island, you know, really need to think of our responsibility to not push that balance um, any further in the wrong direction. And so, like I was mentioning earlier, ecological economics is really about reorienting our understanding of our place on this planet, right? We have a planet with its very real biophysical limits. And we are, as humans, form society, we form civilization. And we just happen to be very astute. We happen to be very uh, self-conscious and very smart in terms of the way that we learn from generation to generation that we've technically kind of dominated the planet, right? Um, and then within human society is the economy. And we have designed the economy to work the way it does. It doesn't, it doesn't just magically or inevitably work that way. It works that way because we decided that it should. And we've continued to perpetuate that system versus, you know, mainstream economics that tells us that, listen, everything kind of needs to serve the economy. Everything is going to go bust if the economy isn't um, thriving. You know, screw the environment, screw society, unless we get the economy going up and up and up every year. When, when that's just simply not true, right? The economy is entirely of our own making and we are able to remake it and refashion it 
um, in whatever way we'd like. And I think we'd like to do that in a way that's actually in line with sustainable development, that actually promotes the possibility for our own continuation of our species and of other species, because we need all of the other species and biodiversity to exist in order to maintain the systems and the processes that we've become so reliant on as humans. So that was a lot. And now I'm gonna ask you to reflect on maybe what are some of the challenges you think you have with the SDGs, um, whether you've thought of that before today or based on you know, what you've heard so far, what are some things that you feel like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to, where to begin with this thing, or I have a specific question about this. And I have, a slido that we can use, but you're also free to just go into the chat. Yes, you can join the slido here. Yeah, I see the comment from Golnaz of using the common approach, common foundations for their impact model and how to localize and align with the SDGs. Love that. We're gonna be talking about common approach and impact measurement a bit later today. Has everyone gotten in? So feel free to put it in the Slido, put it in the chat, turn off your mic and just yell it out. Uh, tell us a bit about some of the challenges or the thoughts or the questions that you have when you think about the sustainable development goal. No thought or question is silly. You think too big. I get that. How do we even localize? Okay, so we're all kind of on the same wavelength here. How to make them authentic? I love that one. Yeah, so they're really big. How do we make it, you know, real for our context at the local level or at the organization level? How to even choose which ones are most impactful or relevant for us? Um, how to get some quantitative measurements in there? How do we make products more sustainable while keeping costs down? These are some genuine concerns, and I hope to answer at least 90%. If I don't, please bring it up again at the Q&A at the end. So to start off with, back up. we're going to be talking about how exactly we're able to map opportunities for impact, right? Because the greatest social and environmental impact that your company has might be beyond the scope of the assets that you own or control with some of the greatest opportunities happening for the upstream or downstream in the value chain. So you really need to think about the entire value chain when we explore opportunities for impact. Um, because yeah, not all 17 SDGs are going to be equally relevant. I really don't want you to feel like you need to sit down and figure out targets and indicators for all 17, you know, especially if you're now starting out, maybe, maybe a larger organization or maybe further down the line that becomes possible, but it's really not necessary. You really want to assess instead, what are the current positive, potential positive and negative impacts that you're SDGs might have along the value chain. And then we identify, you know, key areas for impact and then we work on those. So what, what is positive? How can we improve it? What is negative? How do we get it to, if not positive, at least neutral, right? So the extent to which your company can contribute to each of the SDGs and the risks and opportunities they individually represent will depend on many factors. So going through this exercise is going to help you identify where positive impacts can be scaled and where negative impacts can be reduced or avoided. 
And so it's the next section of your workbook. We'll be looking at mapping the value chain. So you can turn to page 10, I think it is. And we're going to be mapping the value chain, right? So like I said before, some of the biggest impact you have mightn't just even just be in within the scope of your core operations, but it might happen along that value chain. So from the resources you need to the final product end of life and how they get disposed. If you're a service organization, that's a little different and we can talk about that too. So this is, doesn't really require like a detailed assessment of every single SDG at every stage of the value chain. But what we're going to do instead is a high value, a high level scan of where the impacts can be expected to be greatest, whether that's negatively or positively. Um, and some tools you can look into um, on your own about how to do this in more depth, are like life cycle assessments, environmentally extended input output analysis models. Um, but what I think is really key to think about is stakeholder engagement. So how, how much are you engaging your community of stakeholders and clients and customers or other communities that are impacted by your work in your assessment of your impact, right? So like I said, let's go to page 10. And I'm going to walk you through this example here. And on that page 10, I want you to think through these steps uh, within your own workbook or for your own enterprise, right? So this is a water bottling company. And so they've identified five major SDGs, right? So along raw materials, there isn't anything too huge, at least to them at this time. But when we get to the suppliers, we do see an opportunity that the company identifies to reduce a negative impact on, on SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation in a supply chain by working with suppliers to reduce water consumption in water stressed regions, right? So you want to make sure that your suppliers are not overusing water in the production process. Sorry, this is a manufacturing company. So you wanna make sure that in, in the manufacturing process, they're not overusing water. And so this is a positive, a possible negative impact across suppliers and that's, that's big for them. And then inbound logistics. So how does the product get from the supplier into the core operations? Um, the co company identified the key priority to decrease the negative impact on SDG 11 um, by improving road safety for all its drivers, right? So sustainable cities and communities is SDG 11. And part of that is good road safety. Part of that is good infrastructure for transportation. And so the company has decided they want to invest, uh, whether that is directly or through um, advocating to, to local councils about how we can make sure that this is done safe more safely both for people and for the, the surrounding environment because roads cut through landscapes and then when we get to core company operations like many of you identified SDG 8 decent work is huge and key um, so you want to increase the positive impacts by providing a living wage to all employees at all sites globally you know you might want to push that even further like look down the supply chain and push all of your suppliers to themselves um, provide a living wage to all of their to all of their employees at, at every site and branch, right? And then distribution is the is similar to inbound logistics. Instead of the supplier to operations, it's operations to customers and clients. So road safety again, and then product use, right? So the company has identified the priority to increase a positive impact on climate action for use of its products by developing and delivering products that allow customers to reduce their energy use and related GHG emissions. So looking at the actual product and making sure that it is even more low carbon, even less resource intensive, um, even less energy intensive than other, than other products or services on the market. And in that way, you're helping your customers to achieve their own you know, sustainable lifestyles, but also making sure that the product is as sustainable as possible. And then product end of life, which is so important to think about. What happens 
you know, oftentimes in business, we, we think about this is what the product is. We're going to ship it out to everybody. You know, maybe we think about recycling, recyclable packaging or whatnot. But you really want to think about how is the product disposed of? How is it responsibly disposed of? Where does it go? Can it truly be recycled or composted um, wherever it is you're selling it? Or does it always just end up to landfill? Right. So this company has identified um, a negative impact on SDG 12, which is all about responsible production and consumption. Um, and they'd like to reduce that negative impact um, by improving the reusability and recyclability of its products. You know, so many times companies buy a certain type of packaging or, or roadmap um, based on their own ideas of what might be sustainable without really properly assessing what's possible in that local community. Um, and so I think it's really key to think about how, how, how can this be disposed of responsibly, where exactly I'm selling it, um, who needs access to it, um, can the local recycling system or composting system actually recycle or compost it, because different recycling systems are different. Another complementary value chain. Um, no, I don't have um, a separate value chain. I would say that for services, um, the value chain is just a bit shorter. So, you know, maybe you're not using raw materials for the products, but there are materials that you do use in order to provide your service, right? Whether that be office supplies or you know use of the internet you can think about it's a bit it's a, it gets a bit more granular than product-based businesses tend to have to get um, but those are also important to think about right our energy usage is a uh, is a usage on on carbon right our, our our internet usage is a usage on carbon you know how many of you have heard of you know cryptocurrency drilling and how terrible that is for the environment even though it's like a virtual currency that's still bad. So like even now that we're on the internet, this is having an impact. This is having a, a use of um, some of our natural resources to be here virtually today. Um, so it really, so for the service-based businesses, right? So your raw materials are a little different. Your suppliers are probably similarly um, digitally based. Um, but if you do have an in-person service, let's say you have some sort of office that people come to, you want to think about, you know, are you using the most sustainable office supplies? Um, how, are you, how are you using transportation and fuel to serve your clients? Um, if any of you are a service-based business, please feel free to like drop in the chat what kind of service you provide so I can get more specific for you. Um, but you get to those resources that you use, you get to the core operations. Um, I think decent work is still pretty big here, gender equality, how much of the staff are women identifying, um, youth inclusion, how, how are youth included? Um, and then in terms of product use, again, it's, it's less about actual physical product, but how are people, how, impact how, how much of an impact on the environment do your services have when people use them so maybe there's none maybe it's similar to the resources you use in terms of their internet usage or you know their landline usage or whatever it is they do using edge as a case study oh that's cool so yeah so edge has some physical you know offices and classrooms um, so you want to think about that. You want to think about the the waste, the waste system through the physical school, um, and you know the lighting, the internet, and everything that that's that's needed in order to run a school. And then, yeah, like I said, all of the resources that that students or entrepreneurs are using for themselves in order to run their businesses. Um, so maybe use the reaction function and let me know how this exercise is going for you. Do you need more time? Thumbs up if you're good to go, you know, maybe a smiley face if you're going well, but you still, we're still talking. Thumbs down if you need more time or you have a question 
or you're confused and need some help. Okay, so like I said, sometimes you're gonna have some negative impacts and sometimes you're gonna have some positive impacts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Physical footprints and operations, absolutely. Yeah, feel free to type it in the chat. So I am curious to know, based on that exercise, join me here on Slido and tell me how, how you've been thinking about the SDGs. Did it help you think about more SDGs than the one you thought of at the beginning? Are you thinking about the exact same SDGs and it hasn't changed at all? Have you actually focused down and it's like fewer SDGs than you thought? you needed to think about at the beginning. All right, one person is thinking about more, one person's at the same number. Anyone else? Uh, so Ashley, in, in terms of raw materials as a service, um, yeah, it comes down to more about like how you design the programming, right? So like, are you using, you know, pre-COVID, I would be asking about like your, your paper usage and water usage um, in terms of in-person activities, but even virtually, what are some of the materials that you actually use? And sometimes, you know, in a digital world, it's all on the computer, which is great and fine, but the computer and your internet use and your electricity use is also an impact. Um, and, and we can't necessarily, you know, eliminate that impact or that usage, but we can think of ways to reduce it, you know? Do you know that even like unsubscribing from all of those, those um, marketing emails you get that you never open, that can reduce your, your carbon footprint? Like there are little things like that in terms of how we use things, how we're using email and the internet um, that can really help in terms of raw materials for the service-based business. All right, so the majority are thinking about more SDGs than we did. And some are saying, no, we're still at the same number, which is all cool. Um, and so second to that, I wanna know how did you find mostly areas of positive impact? Were there some areas of negative impact that you want to think about how to reduce some areas where you're just like, eh, it's neutral. There's no way to really reduce it. Um, and it's not really bad. I'm still not sure about some of those impacts and that's totally fine. Anyone else, when you did this activity, you know, you, you wanna identify the goals that come out to you, but also like, is, are you identifying something that's already something that's potentially a positive impact that you just want to increase? Or is it something that was a negative impact um, that you're trying to reduce that negative impact of? And it's totally fine to not know. Um, if a lot of people are feeling like still not sure, then I would love to take a moment to chat about it. I think we have time. Yeah, we have time. So I'm actually going to... Maybe if we have time, maybe it would be cool to touch on it. Yeah, 
yeah, we definitely have time. So I'm actually going to stop sharing right now so that we can talk about it. So who wants to volunteer up their example? Um, tell me a bit about, you know, some of the steps in the process that you're unsure about and or just tell me about your business and we can talk through, you know, whether or not these are some positive or negative or neutral impacts to consider. Chat is fine. Turn off your mic is fine. Turn off your mic and turn off your camera is fine. Let's hear it. Okay, how many of you are product-based businesses? You can use a thumbs up or a heart. Okay, so one thumb up. Does everyone else service-based businesses? How many of you are service-based businesses? All right, um, so what are some of the, when you went through the value chain or when you thought about your value chain, um, what's a, what is an SDG that popped out in doing the exercise? Reducing inequalities. Okay, Ashley. Um, and do you mind telling us a bit about um, like what is what does your business do and how is it maybe impacting reduced inequalities? A little bit of context from you, Shai. Sure, no problem. Um, for some context. Um, my venture is black owned. Great showcase and explore black owned businesses. Uh, we will be launching in January a pilot program for youth, black youth entrepreneurs, so ages um, 18 to 29, who already have a venture or a business that they've started and need help growing. And so in terms of reducing inequalities in the, um, I guess this pipeline, this value chain that you were discussing, um, I see that coming into play in terms of the mentors that are a part of that program or um, the different facilitators who we, we have coming in to teach the, the business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, maybe there we're trying to reduce inequalities by having more diversity represented represented um, in those cases. Yeah, I mean, it's even core to your operations, right? It's even in the participants, you know, the fact that you're doing this work to empower those particular, that particular community of participants means that you're reducing mm -hmm. inequalities that's happening in society, right? Because now, BIPOC youth have better access to funding or support to actually, you know, excel and build out their business. And we have a greater representation of BIPOC youth in entrepreneurship. So it's like, it's like right. so core to what you're doing, you didn't even think of it. But like, yeah, like it's literally <laughs> like right there um, in, in that work of participants. And that's definitely a positive impact that you're already having positively. And if anything, you can just double down and, you know, probably find ways to make it better. Right, right. Yeah. Any others that you were um, unsure about? 
any other goals, I mean? Did anyone else have some, you know, impacts that they're not sure about? Decent work and economic growth. Yeah, that, that one is, is definitely in there, right? So like how well are your staff getting compensated? Is it a living wage? How do we find ways to empower you to do that? What is what is their like work life balance look like? What is their experience of labor in the organization? I personally don't want to talk about economic growth, but we could talk about, you know, I mean, the growth of your business is definitely, you know, a valid idea at, at the micro level, you know, or even the capacity to support your participants in scaling their businesses to become, you know, financially sustainable over time. Right, that's uh, more along the lines, I guess, of how I was thinking about it was how to help um, the businesses scale. Yeah, so again, that's, I mean, it seems to be core to your operations, like you're putting together, you know, um, capacity building programs to help them do their work better. And so one, it's about, you know, the mentors and the staff that you recruit and how well are they getting compensated uh, for their time. Um, what 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 do those labor relations look and feel like for everyone? And then how are you able to scale so that you're able to, you know, increase your impact for community? And then how are you able to empower your participants to scale their own enterprises so that they find some financial sustainability for themselves and economic empowerment for themselves? But I would say that's one that you already have, you know, positive impact for, and you're again just doubling down. And I think I think that's that's kind of a benefit that a lot of you who are like in the early stages are coming up on. Like you're probably not really doing anything that's having a negative impact just yet. Um, I think if you're product based, there's an opportunity to think a little deeper there. Um, but as a startup in the service space, I think, yeah, just looking at the ways to reduce um, internet usage, and I could probably follow up with some more resources. I didn't really bring much on that today. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's really about, I guess, honing in on what are your impact areas, getting really specific, um, and then setting up that impact measurement process that we're going to talk about in a little bit to really build out evidence, to learn from yourself, to do better and to be accountable to your stakeholders. Yeah, I love to see your face, Ashley. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashley. Alicia, I had one question. Maybe that's something yeah. that you'll touch on down the line as well. Um, but for, for ventures or for entrepreneurs that are providing services to, let's say, um, either underrepresented populations, or if they're providing services into spaces, for example, in rural areas. Um, does, that, does that fall under reducing inequalities? And if it does, is that something that you can measure from an impact perspective and speak about? Or is that not, I guess, is, is that like a genuine reducing inequality um, perspective or is that something that is just stretching it too much because that's okay. at times something that I think about when I think about SDGs in our work where I'm like is this something and not just the work that I do right now but generally um, if that's a stretch if I'm just because a lot of the times I would think about in economic growth uh, a lot of people would be like employment is economic growth so technically any business would fall under SDGs. And I would always be like, but that's not 
that's probably not true. Um, mm -hmm. So I wondered the same for reducing inequalities in terms of ventures that are specifically providing support to underrepresented populations. How can they talk about reducing inequalities in more authentic ways uh, mm -hmm. and align with the SDGs? Yeah, so I think a key part of this, like you said, it's really easy to get into like greenwashing on this stuff, like just because you have some jobs means that you provided employment means that you like advance this particular SDG, but it's really like what is the quality of that employment right so your employment has to intersect with decent work has to intersect with no poverty has to intersect with good health and well being, and really, really looking holistically at how how these things intersect right so maybe you don't really feel like all those other SDGs I just listed are really central to your work, but you identify this one piece of employment. But then it's like, how does how is employment being qualified by all these other pieces? So in terms of reducing inequalities, it's the same thing, right? Like just because you're just because you're employing rural communities or you know people of color um, doesn't in itself mean that you're really advancing the SDGs, right? Like you need to you need to be thinking about how, what does that employment look like? Are they all receiving living wages? What is, you know, are they are they having like healthy boundaries and relationships? And this gets a bit more into the minutia than the than the, the technical, you know, sustainable development goal framework puts out. But that's because it's looking at this global thing, right? And so Unfortunately, we don't have very clear guidelines about how we're supposed to translate the global down to the local. So it's really, it's really up to us. And I think in taking on this responsibility, we really need to be trying to think really holistically about all of these pieces. So we want to reduce inequality. We want to engage more rural communities. Great. How are we engaging them? How are they employed? Um, how are they being taken care of? What, what are the other holistic pieces of their economic and social well-being that's being tapped into through employment from you or through engagement with you um, beyond just, you know, some kind of checkbox, right? Like that's in, in this example, like we'll get into that in the impact measurement section, but that's not really an indicator. That's just a metric number of, you know, number of rural, rural people who signed up or got employed. It's about the quality of that. So number of rural number of rural employees who have a living wage, number of rural employees who, you know, feel like their career is advancing advantageously for them, who find it easy to get to and from work if we're looking at sustainable cities and communities, um, the infrastructure that they have to navigate to do that work. So yeah, Thank it's a so level. Much. No worries. It's a little, um, unfortunately, vague, but it's like up to us to get as specific as we can in order to really fine tune what are the impact areas and how are we really living up to this. And to also, frankly, improve on what the, you know, the, the UN at the global level is talking about. Absolutely. And I think the vagueness does provide space for for smaller businesses, for entrepreneurs to really work in ways and think about impact in ways that makes more sense to the localized spaces that they're working in. So it really works in their favor, but I really appreciate the, the comment on intersectionality. I do think that it's incredibly important to see SDGs from an intersectional perspective um, and kind of see how they're holistically supporting people or holistically doing Good, because they're very, very interlinked. Like all of them are connected to each other in really interesting ways. Oh. Exactly. And so like when I said earlier, you don't have to think about, you don't have to like choose all 17 SDGs. It doesn't mean that you don't have to think about them, right? So like maybe you choose five, but you also need to think about how are the other SDGs interacting with those five that you chose? Because like you said, they are so interlinked. They are so interdependent. No one of them exists without the others to support it, right? We can't get we can't get to eradicating poverty if we haven't achieved gender equality. You know, none of, none of it is going to be able to happen in a silo, and neither are your impacts. Yes, thank you, Ashley. 
Does anyone else have any other questions? Global reporting. Yeah, Global Reporting Initiative. Yeah, the GRI does have a great framework out there as well. Is, that, is anyone else still feeling unsure about areas of positive or negative impact against the SDGs? Elizabeth, did you want to say something? Oh, yes. I don't know if you can, you can hear me okay. That's yeah, great. I'm I sorry. I, I did come late, so I missed um, oh, the, the first half. But my um, service, my social enterprise is around um, housing, and it's to reduce the inequalities for people who are on social assistance who have like very limited or to no choices when they looking for rentals that they can actually afford within their um, housing stipend they receive. So I'm just looking at the um, SDGs and, and seeing where that might fit. And maybe it's an intersectional one as well. Is it, would you say that's more under the no poverty um, goal? Uh, no poverty, absolutely. Though poverty in the sense, I think um, the, like when we get into the targets and the indicators, it speaks a bit more to like the income levels and um, sustenance. So housing obviously is a, I mean, it should be a human right, but it is one of those basic human needs. I would also look at sustainable cities and communities. That's where you get a bit more detail into housing, um, okay. reduced inequalities, thinking about the different ways that we have access to housing and not um, the ways that we have access to, you know, things like mortgages and rent and rent control. Mm, right. Health so and much. well-being is necessary. Yeah. So like there, there are a few that you can look at if, if you happen to find that a lot of your clients or customers um, are overwhelmingly women, then there's something to say there about gender equality and the inequality in access to housing for women. I don't want to put that assumption on it, though. So, yeah. You let me yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. My pleasure. So uh, we're at 617. I can either get into the next session where we look at the goals and how we're going to identify some targets but I want to also honor people's energy levels. Do you feel like you'd rather have a 10 minute break right now and then get into the rest of it for tonight? Or do you want to get into the goals and targets and then we'll take a break in another like 10 to 15 minutes? Um, thumbs up if you want to take a break right now. Okay, now thumbs up if you want to keep going, no break. I think we have a tie here. Um, I'm going to honor those who are a bit more tired and we're gonna take a 10 minute break um, so come back at 6.28. I'm just going to put on some music um, from some of my favorite Trini artists in the meantime. Um, so feel free to, you know, stretch your legs, go get some water or a snack, use the bathroom, whatever the heck it is you need to do to take care of yourself right now. now clear that the region is a sleeping giant, but who will dream the dream to wake her up? Remember his car with the blood down in your bed. Remember your sunshine now. You may be ready. We do it a billion times. We 
go do it again. Stand firm and never let your heart be troubled. this carnival lightly hmm? the way we laugh and dance and smile <laughs> how melody rolls out of us like the waves crashing all over the hearts of mankind if you only knew what we've been through you would understand how amazing our joy is and what a marvel it is to be a Caribbean Anywhere you come from, could I up you, could I down blessings on my nation? Let me hear you say 
so I know you're back in the room with me. <laughs> all right, all right, hopefully maybe you don't have headphones on and you're hearing your computer talking to you again and we can get back into this today. All right, dude. 
so to recap, um, can any, everyone get back to the annotate function given the, ex the exercise we just did of mapping your value chain? And I'd like to see where you end up this time. So in view options, you should see annotate show up as an option and just select stamp and tell me where, where you're landing now in your SVGs. A couple of you said you're thinking about more of them. Okay, okay, yeah, I've been hearing decent work a lot today, reduced inequalities a lot today. And then no poverty has come up, sustainable cities and communities has come up, gender equality has come up, responsible consumption and production, partnerships for the goals. So maybe you're in some sort of partnership model of your impact. Climate action, so in some way reducing GHG emissions or encouraging your customers to do so. All right, you. So now we're going to be using this to take us further into our exploration. So we already took a break. Goals to targets. Right, so when we look at our goal setting approach, um, on the right hand side here is the outside in approach, which is really what we're thinking of today, right? Um, typically, we have an internally focused approach on the left, um, where you kind of just set your goals internally and then you just kind of benchmark that over time without really thinking about the context happening outside of you. Whereas the outside in approach encourages you to think about what's happening around you, what, what is happening globally, what is happening locally in your society, what are some of the challenges or some of the demands or the needs being expressed by the community, and how can we use our businesses as a force for good in addressing those needs as you know, identified by community. And so we're going to get down to the nitty gritty in choosing, so the goals that you've chosen, I say, you know, three to five is fine. If you wanna do more, that's great. Um, we're going to identify the targets from the SDGs that make sense for you. And then we're gonna translate those into uh, a language that makes sense for you, right? So it's really about scaling down the targets um, that exist. So you can go to this link, which is also linked in your workbook. Um, it's somewhere on page 11 is the link, but then in your workbook, we're gonna be looking at pages, well, 12 and 13 if you need it. And I am in fact gonna to go to that page myself here so that we can work this out together in a second. So essentially, um, forget the right-hand column of indicators. Right now, we're just looking at the goals you've identified and how are we going to choose the targets for that middle column. So for example, a lot of you have um, identified goal eight, um, and this is the full text of goal eight, to promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. And one of the targets under goal eight is this one, target 8.5, to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men, including young people, people with disabilities, equal pay for work of equal value. And so how would we translate that into a target that makes sense for your organization, right? So obviously your organization has full and productive employment. Um, but when it comes to goal eight, maybe a target is that all of your employees have a living wage or that 
you have a staff that spans all genders. That's another limitation of the SDG that's very in this gender binary of women and men. And we know obviously that that's not true. Um, so you have representation of all genders. You have representation of a range of age groups, including youth and older um, working folks, um, people with disabilities and equal pay, right? And how do we make sure that we're doing that? is to really think about what, what do these different groups of people need in order to feel welcome and safe in the organization. So I am actually just going to go to that link myself. I hope that you're already there. So here we are in the metadata repository. And so what it does here is it breaks down the goal. So like we said, a lot of people like goal eight and we have all of these options here under goal eight for targets. Per capita economic growth, maybe that's not so relevant. Um, high levels of economic productivity. Maybe you want to you know, improve your yeah, improve your economic productivity, but again, maybe not so relevant at the startup stage. Um, resource efficiency and consumption. Full and productive employment is the one that I just highlighted. Um, reduce the proportion of youth not in employment. So really think of a target that speaks to this spirit of the goal, which is to promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable um, economies and full and productive employment and decent work for everyone. Um, does anyone want to volunteer? Maybe think of a target that makes sense for your organization, taking, in, taking to, into account these um, UN targets um, for this goal. Feel free to use the chat or unmute and chat, unmute and talk. You know, here we have labor rights. Maybe you need to set up uh, an HR policy that you don't have yet. Maybe you want to set up a paid internship program so that youth are always, you know, gainfully employed in your organization. And I also heard a lot about goal 10, right? So reduced inequalities. And the full language of the goal is reduced inequalities within and among countries. Obviously not really, you know, an attainable, you know, goal for you at the organizational level. Maybe you just want to reduce inequalities within and amongst people in your community. And, you know, to do that, you're focusing on some marginalized or underrepresented, underrepresented or under, underserved um, communities in your programming or your customer base. So here we're talking about um, the social, economic and political inclusion of everyone. I heard that a lot in Ashley's business. Um, also in Elizabeth's business, you know, I think housing has a lot to do with your social, economic and political inclusion. Social protection. So are you able to provide, you know, benefits or insurance in addition to the compensation that people receive in exchange for their labor? You know, again, a lot of these targets. Yeah, exactly. So you have it's good. It's good to really see the targets in front of you, and you see that a lot of them really aren't so relevant at your level of scale, right? So you really don't need to think about all of these targets because a lot of them are talking about like remittances. Unless you're maybe you're a business that's set up to support um, remittances that happen, so the money that people that immigrants to Canada send to family back home. 
um, that's a very specific example in which you know this this piece of it would be relevant for you. Otherwise, you're really talking about this the spirit of the goal, right? So these are the different pieces of it that the UN has identified across you know income growth, um, social, political, economic inclusion, um, equality of outcomes. Um, eliminating discriminatory laws, policies, and practices. Again, that goes to like your HR maybe in your business or some of the other like institutional policies you put down for clients or customers or participants in your programs. Yeah, making sure that everyone has a voice. Um, sustainable cities and communities. So here we want to make cities and human set of settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So here we go, right here, Elizabeth, I think talk at 11.1, you could just like take it for yourself, ensure access for all to adequate, safe, and affordable housing and basic services. You know, if, if your work has something to do with it, air quality or waste management than this one of the per capita environmental impact of the people who engage with your products or services. So sustainable consumption and production, we want to look at sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources. Um, if you're in the food space, looking at food waste, looking at other kinds of waste. Um, if you, if you, you know, engage with chemicals, that's really important to think about. Um, general waste reduction through reduction, recycling and reuse, and really thinking critically about how easy is it for your customers to recycle and reuse your products. adopt sustainable practices and to integrate sustainability information into your reporting cycle. So again, you know, this works for products as well as services, you know, maybe you're not able to really change too much in terms of how you do things or serve things as a service provider, but you're able to talk about sustainability in some way. Um, if someone wants to speak up and, you know, use your business as an example that we can walk through please feel free. If you'd rather just quietly fill out your workbook, that's fine too. Making, you know, making people aware of the relevant information for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles. So some, you know, customer education is important there. I did see at least one person hit on goal 17, which is about partnerships. So this is another one where you might find that all of this stuff really doesn't feel relevant to your business. So we're talking about global partnerships for sustainable development. So any partnership that you can engage in that helps to support the positive impacts that you're trying to have counts under this goal. And you know, maybe your target is a certain number of partnerships you want to achieve or a certain outcome of those partnerships. So we want to engage in partnerships that allow us to execute this objective. Does anyone want to volunteer their example? Is anyone, okay, is anyone struggling with, you know, coming up with targets for the goals that they identified for their business? Let's start there.
if you're not struggling, maybe tell us what you already came up with. So it might help someone else who's struggling. Yeah, so in terms of the SDGs, this is a good question about how is partnership defined? So here, partnership is really about the, the means of implementation. So it's about what relationships and collaborations are needed to enable us to execute on all of the other goals, right? So for your enterprise, it's what collaborations and partnerships are needed for you to for you to implement on the targets and the goals that are important for you and your impact. Yeah, so in Ashley's case of capacity building for, you know, youth of color with their own entrepreneurial um, activities, you know, maybe, maybe she has a partnership with some other resource provider or some other capacity builder in order to reach more youth or to give the youth more resources and um, training opportunities. Yes, Golnaz. Uh, could you uh, take us through uh, SDG number five and how one might localize some of the indicators for that one? I, we've just found them to be very um, international development focused and not necessarily the wording doesn't seem to align with our local efforts as, as directly. Absolutely. So yeah, again, this is one where the targets really, really stick to that international level that isn't so, you know, useful to you at the organizational level. But the goal here is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. Um, so there are different ways that your that your business can, you know, look at this, whether it's looking for gender parity in hiring, in the executive staff, if you have a board of directors um whether it's looking at policies around harassment and abuse in the workplace or in you know in use of your products or services um yeah so then so then policies like that get to the to the spirit of these things right so women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership how are you making sure that women feel empowered and supported in order to take on leadership in your organization or your business? Or maybe you have some female clients or customers or participants, how are they empowered? What are, what are the, the social determinants, the, the other pieces of the puzzle around what you're doing that, that makes that possible for women to really show up, um, to feel empowered and to feel safe? So if we have short term and um, in terms of our measurement of our um, outcomes, we have uh, different programs that we run. Some are one day in length, others are 10 weeks in length. And for, for example, employment is one that we want to measure. But what we've said is um, number of participants that uh, find employment through our network and programming within a year out because that's not always something we can measure or, or you know, like evaluate immediately after the pro program, it does take time. Um, others are more self reports around feeling more confident around X, Y, Z, or um, how much uh, an individual has enhanced their network with mm -hmm. leaders or with um, decision makers that may have influence. Would those things make sense? Yeah, those do make sense. However, those are all indicators. They're not really telling me what your target is, right? So you've jumped from goal to indicator, but what is like your organizational target? And it might be as simple as your target is that, sorry, you go ahead. I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, no, it's okay. So for targets, what we've done is we have a combination. I apologize. I had to jump out. So I came in halfway through this discussion. So I missed the whole targets piece. For Target, um, we have some based on um, uh, benchmarks from our first program, and we had an intern um, who was working with us on this, and, and they actually researched other like programs, although we couldn't find any that were exact. 
And through their impact reports, we were able to get find some numbers to actually base some targets around um, data where we didn't have it ourselves. So I don't know if that makes sense to you or if that's you know the way to go with targets. Yeah, that makes sense. But in terms of, okay, so the first indicator you mentioned is about the number of women who are able to find jobs within a year mm -hmm. after the program. Mm -hmm. So what was, mm -hmm. what was the target that that indicator was tied to? What is the target? I, I'd have yeah. to go back to my report. I don't know okay. what target we set for that one. But for, uh, for example, self-reports around some of the outcomes that we have around skills or sense of self, uh, I think we sent benchmarks of 85% on, on the Likert scale because we found other like programs or our past programs where we, we had some benchmarks that, that we could kind of base it on. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good example of going through different impact, you know, different examples that exist. So in the, on the, for everyone else, on the resources list in the workbook, I do put the link to SDG Good Practices that gets you some examples of companies and organizations around the world that are claiming some work on the SDGs, but you'll find that not everyone really gets into the nitty gritty very well. So in this case, you know, I would say the target would be a certain amount or a certain percentage of participants mm -hmm. who go through your program who, you know, find employment within a year. And then you're able to track that and your indicator, you know, comes from the numbers from all of the different programs, regardless of the, the short time length of it. You, you find a time, a time frame that makes sense for your organization. And so is it totally okay to reward some of the targets? Absolutely. Please do. That's, li that's literally what we're doing right now. You know, so we're taking the goal and we're looking at these targets and trying to find, okay, how can I wordsmith this um, to really still speak to the, you know, the essence or the spirit of the goal. We want to achieve gender equality and empower all women. And then absolutely reject that. You don't need to use these targets at all. Um, you know, use them as inspiration, but make, make it make sense for your scale. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Anybody else want some help going through one? Or are we ready to jump into the indicators? All right, well, I'm hoping that silence is confidence and not fair today. Um, for the indicators, we're really doing the same thing. So I'm not even gonna open up the slide deck again. We're still gonna be here and now we're going to like dive a little deeper. So some of these, like we said, aren't going to be useful. So here we're looking at full and effective participation and equal opportunities for women under this goal of achieving gender equality. And so an indicator, like Golnaz had that great indicator of hers of, you know, the number of women who are able to secure employment within a year of the program. Um, in terms of Ashley's project, sorry, Ashley's enterprise that's working on capacity building for Black youth or youth of color, um, you know, maybe it's the number of enterprises that scale uh, within a year of your programs or the number of enterprises that um, attract funding or the number of enterprises that are still operating, right? Because small business operation is hard and not all of them are going to succeed and maybe a metric of your own success, an indicator of your own success as the capacity builder side is the number of them that are able, that are still running, that are still, you know, sustained their operations for one year, five years past um, engaging with your programming. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. I think I know the answer, but I would love to hear your thoughts. How does this um, align with the impact blue, blueprint canvases? 
So right now we've developed our social impact, our customer impact, our financial impact, and our operational impact canvas. If we just focus on social impact, we have your um, impact statement, your outcomes, and then your KPIs. Mm -hmm. How do these two jive? So I think in terms of, so when we're looking at the SDGs, I think we are looking specifically at the social impact um, yes. pillar of that work. And so like your, your indicators that you choose out of your SDG selection should be the same as your KPIs, right? Your yes. outcomes should be the same as the top, your outcomes on, or your on targets. that one are the same that thing as your targets. Got it. Yep. So it's, all the same, it's all the same thing we're saying, just using different labels on it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to share in the chat maybe some targets you've come up with? Or indicators? There's also a link in the workbook to um, the SDG Compass uh, Business Indicator Repository. Um, please take that with a grain of salt. I think, you know, it's, it can be helpful for getting ideas, but it's really kind of designed for like bigger corporations, but you might be able to find some things within your own impact area, whatever focus your enterprise is on for different kinds of indicators that other people are using that could be helpful. Yes, thank you, Golan. That's a great indicator. So the percentage of the mentors you've engaged with who have referred a participant to other contacts or job opportunities of theirs, right? And that would speak to a target of What would it speak to a target of? I think I think it speaks to the overall target of that 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 initial target of you know the proportion of you know, participants who find employment within a year. And then one of the indicators to tell you that is not just the number of participants, but maybe you need to learn about how effective your mentorship pieces it to it. So the percentage of the mentors who are able to influence and find job opportunities for the participants. Ah. Excellent. So yeah, that's an outcome. So partners and mentors use their power, influence, and or structurally enabled advantages to create systemic change and advance by walk in their careers. Yeah, that's great. Okay, what I'm going to do now is switch into a conversation on impact measurement more generally. I think that might help us. And then if we want to, we can come back to this activity and this exercise, right? So let's think about how we take these goals that we've decided for ourselves. I think it's really helpful to think more about the targets for this next session. So you have the SDG goal, which is this big, overarching kind of thematic goal and then you really want to get to the specific outcomes or targets that you have you know designed based on that goal for your organization and we're going to use those targets now to set up or to think about um, an impact measurement process Why did it start over? Okay. Right, so just a bit more context around the indicator selection. You want to make sure that you're identifying indicators for each target 
that, that's helping you describe the relationship between the activity that you're doing as an enterprise and their impact on sustainable development. Um, so for example, if you sell water purification tablets, you know, this is, this is the activity that's being undertaken is that sale. And then the indicator would be like the, the qualitative description. So an indicator would be even just the number of sales or, you know, how is it being sold? Yeah, it's really just the number of sales. So that's the amount of the sales. And then here, what's generated tablets sold, the number of the actual tablets that are sold. Um, the outcome is purified water that's consumed as a result of people using that product. So like I mentioned before, SDG Compass has an inventory of business indicators and yeah, go through that on your free time. There's a link in the workbook at the end to it. Take it with a grain of salt. Um, but at the end of the day, you really want to make sure that your, all of your targets are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So getting into impact measurement, or actually before we do that, I will do a pulse check. How is everyone feeling? Let me know with a reaction, with the reactions. And there are other emojis. If those emojis don't speak to your real feelings, feel free to choose one. I will not be offended. All right, all right. I, I'm feeling some, some bubbling energy here. Let's get into impact measurement. So you understand the impact you want to make as an enterprise. How do you know that you're succeeding? Right, so impact measurement is the qualitative or quantitative assessment of impact based on measured observations using theory informed estimation. Right, so what this means is that we never, you can never really pinpoint exactly what happened as a result of your business perfectly, only because, you know, your customers, your clients, they exist in this interconnected world. And there are other forces at play in society that might have also helped them get the outcome um, that matches with the outcome that you were seeking. Um, but what impact measurement does is it allows us to track some specific indicators based on the theory of change that gets us to a decent estimation of you know, what happened because of the work you did, right? Because impact is all about the change that happened in the world, positive or negative, intended or unintended because of what you did. So impact measurement is really like, how are we measuring those changes based on our observations using estimations, right? So we want to make sure that we have decent indicators with a solid theory of change. And then we get to that, that you know, decent estimation of your impact. Can anyone guess why we would measure impact? To hold ourselves and others accountable to our intentions, yeah to report to donors or investors. That's another good one. There's one more and it is to learn from what you're doing, right? In order to do better. Say you, I'm gonna use the examples that I've heard. If you want me to use yours, please let me know more about your business. Um, so say in Elizabeth's case of providing or setting up systems to provide, you know, housing, adequate housing for people, um, 
maybe you're finding for some reason that there's that you haven't seen an increase year over year in the amount of housing placements that you're able to provide and you can't really you're not I mean you probably have an idea why but to really thoroughly understand why you would be doing impact measurement that would bring up these things that would help you assess indicators and get you into you know regular data collection to analyze to understand, okay, well, we did this and it led to this, and this is why, you know, we didn't get the outcome we wanted. And now we know that we can change something to try again, right? So number one is really about doing what you do even better. Impact measurement is about accountability. It's about reporting. Um, it's about, you know, it definitely helps you in your, your, the case for funding, but it's really at the end of the day, it needs to be really relevant to you. It needs to help you um, set up your systems and your programs and your operations in a way that allows for continuous improvement over time. And so I also work with the common approach to impact measurement and we'll be using uh, the common foundations for impact measurement. And this is really meant to be a minimum standard for impact measurement. There are a lot of gold standards out there, like someone mentioned the global reporting initiative, et cetera. Um, common foundations easily aligns with all of the other standards out there. It just breaks it down to the bare bones minimum for those who are really now starting out on an impact measurement journey. So it's not so overwhelming, right? So the first thing you need to do is plan your change. Um, and this is where that goal and target selection really comes in, right? Um, you want to be able to describe how the enterprise working on its own or with others is going to achieve its intended impact. It can't just be some miracle that happens in the middle. There's some plan, there's some intention that goes behind that, right? Um, so some of you would be familiar with a the theory of change that really, or a logic model is another word for it, that really just maps out what happens from your inputs to your activities or organizational operations to the outputs, the outcomes and the long-term impact of your work. And one exercise you can try to map that out if you don't have this thought through already is that currently, you know, this thing is happening. And so if we do this activity, people can choose to do this, which will lead to that outcome. Are there any questions here so far? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait a few seconds here so you can really think through this, right? So. Um, when I was starting out with my consulting practice, I would say that my theory of change started off as currently, you know, local organizations and businesses have no idea what to do with the SDGs. And so if I develop that sort of capacity building um, and product services to help them assess their SDGs, people can choose to engage with the SDGs to set up their impact measurement practices. Um, to join into this global conversation, which would lead to clearer expressions of impact and um, easier access to capital for those organizations. If you don't like writing long sentences, then inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes works just fine too. Right, so it really gets down to like why why you've chosen those operations, or even I would say why you've chosen the goals that you selected and the targets that you selected and how you're going to actually take action on them. So you have this goal and what is it about your operations that's actually going to work toward that goal? Next is this last bit we were just talking about, right? Performance measures or indicators. And these really tell us how we are going to create impact and what changes have occurred over time. So choosing indicators can feel really tough. First, you wanna identify the information you need to show that you made progress and impact. You're going to explore existing indicators because you don't have to make it up from scratch. Um, but sometimes you might find that you prefer making it up from scratch because what exists out there really doesn't speak to your needs. 
you want to be able to link the indicator to your planned outputs and outcomes. So thinking, think more generally about your targets. How does this indicator help you express success um, in achieving that target that you identified? Ensure that your indicators are smart. Um, we talked about that a little earlier. So that means that they are specific, they're measurable, they are attainable, they are relevant to the goal and they are time bound. So it happens, say, you know, the number of people. So for Golnaz's example, the number of people, the number of participants who secured a job within a year, that's specific. You can measure it. You can count their enrollment. It's attainable. Um, in her case, we didn't have an exact goal number, but we know that we can attain a certain amount of that. It's relevant to the core operations and to the overarching goals and it's time bound within a year. And financial proxies, um, these really help those who are working more in, you know, directly in the GHG emission space of just how you're able to find um, a, a dollar value for a social or environmental impact. Um, Cause that can be really nebulous and confusing and there are bureaus um, out there who have done that work and helped to do that work. So, you know, make, make that selection credible. And like I mentioned earlier, there's, different, there's a difference between a metric and an indicator, right? So like number of students who enrolled or number of participants who enrolled in a program, that's just a metric. The indicator is really needs to get back to the impact you're trying to make. So in this example here, it's just, you know, about the grade they achieved. But, you know, like in Golnaz's example, it's about the, the number of them who find a job later. Or in Ashley's example, the number of participants who still have uh, an operating business within three years, maybe. Or maybe for Elizabeth, it's the number of participants who are, st are still housed one or two years after engaging with her enterprise or program. So it's not just a number, it's about the, the number of people who something happened to as a result of engaging with your enterprise or your venture. And, you know, indicator selection, you really want to be, you want to think about feasibility. Sometimes we get really overwhelmed, especially after going through that um, target and indicator listing online that you need to have like 10 indicators. I need to have all this stuff set up and it gets really scary and overwhelming. Honestly, one or two, one or two for each of your targets is quite enough. You don't need to, don't worry about trying to get into a whole bunch of detail. It's really quality over quantity, but also, you know, what can you actually, actually reasonably achieve um, within, you know, your resources, your capacity and your time, because you need to be able to collect the data to, you know, back up all of those indicators here right and data collection is time intensive the data you collect needs to be useful enough to you so that it makes it worth the effort and that usefulness comes out of what information you collect how you collect it and how often you are able to collect it right so if you have too many indicators and there's way too many data points that you need to keep track of that just becomes overwhelming and then you just lose steam really early so choose one or two specific indicators that you have you know, easy enough access to data for. And then in this data collection step, you wanna make sure that you're collecting your data regularly, systematically, and ethically. Think about how you're engaging with people um, for their data. What are the ethics around the information you're taking from people or process? Um, what are the systems you're using to manage data? It could be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet, but you know, how often is it being checked on? Who you know, does the due diligence to make sure that the data in there is correct? Um, and then at the heart of it is what data are you collecting? What is the information you need in order to feed into the indicator that you're trying to track? And then you want to make sure that you're analyzing data regularly. <clears throat> It's only through systematic analysis of data that, of the data you collect and organize that you can gain insight about what's working and how well you're really doing. You want to be able to compare results over time. So this month, 
you had this number of participants or um, yeah, services or you know, service requests. And then next month it's a different number and you need to be able to track those changes to understand so that you know that those changes are happening and it helps it makes you better equipped to assess why those changes are happening and another thing is you want to be giving equal weight to positive and negative findings a lot of times because we're overwhelmed and we're worried about how our stakeholders and community will think of us we just you know focus on all the great things and try to downplay the negative um, but you really want to give equal weighting to this, right? This is this doesn't even have to do with how you're communicating externally. It's about how you're assessing your work internally. If there are things that are not going so well, you know, you want to sp spend some time, give some attention to that stuff so that you're able to turn things around. And finally, uh, you're communicating your results, right? So once you've developed that balanced account of your work and the difference it's making in the world, you can make better decisions about what to do next. Um, you can communicate your achievements and learnings with your community. You can, you know, we talked about that accountability, that uh, tracking progress, um, you know, getting back to the donors, funders, and broader stakeholder and community. Right, so for the SDGs, aligning your company's reporting and communication with the SDGs ensures that there's a common dialogue among your stakeholders. And for each of the SDGs that you identified, you know, when you're thinking about reporting on that impact or communicating it, you want to talk about why you've chosen a certain SDG. How does it, how does it fit back into your organization mission and vision, which we will get to in a minute. Um, the significant impacts, positive or negative, related to that SDG that you chose. Um, the goals for the, the targets that you chose for that SDG and the progress you've made in achieving them and the strategies and practices you've set up to manage impacts around those SDGs. And so now in the workbook, I'm going to give you like a quick two minutes so we can get to the next section. I have distilled a bit some of the questions from the Common Foundation self-assessment. So I have shortened it. It's a, it's a more condensed version of, this, of the self-assessment, but I think it's a good place to start. Um, there's also a link in the workbook to the full self-assessment online that you can go through. And you know, Common Approach also has some resources in terms of helping you understand impact measurement if you're able to get that self, if you're able to complete the self-assessment, don't worry about, you know, how many questions you said yes or no to. Nobody's judging you. You know, nobody's really assessing you. It's a self-assessment for yourself. Um, but yeah, Common Approach will be in touch to um, connect you to some other capacity building support there as well. But for now, let's go to page 17 and look at these questions. Right, so have you described the impact you want to achieve and how you're going to achieve them? Have you identified what activities and outcomes are central to that impact you're trying to make? Do you know what information you need to show that you made an impact? Have you thought about indicators and selected some indicators that are linked to the impacts you want to make? Have you set up a, a data collection plan with some methods that make sense for your organization? And then are you able to implement that, right? Are you collecting your data routinely, consistently, and ethically? Do you have a system for storing and managing that data? That's what we talked about. Excel at the very least, really simple. Um, and in that analysis, you know, comparing results over time to assess your success and your opportunities for improvement. And are you communicating or reporting on your impact regularly and using, using methods and styles that really speak to whoever your audience is, right? So for some of you, you're really thinking about more youthful audiences, so your stakeholders and your communities really consist 
primarily of youth. So you want to think about communicating in a way that makes sense to youth. Don't just publish some 20 page impact report that nobody's going to read. You know, maybe it's an infographic, maybe there's a video attached, maybe there's some sort of interactive online um, yeah, platform that really maps out that impact. But it doesn't have also doesn't have to be anything too intensive, right? Keep it simple, keep it concise, keep it targeted. And then the next piece of your stakeholder engagement, let me get back to the slides. is stakeholder engagement, right? You want to make sure that you are engaging stakeholders in every part of your process. You want to invite your community, whether that's your clients, your customers, your participants, or even the people around them. You know, even in some of your cases, your mentors um, or the other trainers you hire. Um, I haven't heard from anyone yet about um, you know, geographically set businesses. Maybe Elizabeth, you have some of that in your housing. Um, so maybe the, the wider community around the housing pro project, how do they feel about what you're doing and the impact and difference you're making? And how are you inviting them into conversation with you um, when it comes to what your goals and targets should be and how you should be, you know, ethically collecting data to those ends? And so on page 18 of the workbook, you have some space to really um, think about that, you know, try to make a list of all the stakeholders, think broadly, not just your clients or customers or participants, think about all of the people that even have like, that are indirectly impacted by your activities, and then think about how you're going to engage them, not just in a shallow communication sense, but how do you invite them in to be a part of your impact and to help you set the tone for the impact you're trying to achieve? You know, I fully acknowledge that this part is, and Common Approach has acknowledged that that part of, in, of stakeholder engagement is really difficult, especially in the beginning stages. So don't stress yourself too much about it. But, you know, make sure you're taking some time to think about it and have or create space for those conversations to come up. <clears throat> and there's your impact, right? Intent, you have your goal, your targets, your indicators, your action, you engage in your operations, you collect your data, you analyze it, and you come to your outcomes, the changes that you make in the world. And don't forget to think about maybe some of those negative or unintended outcomes and how you're able to Sometimes you're able to think about them in advance and mitigate them. Sometimes they blindside you and you're surprised and that's okay. Um, but you wanna think about not just the intent, but really think about the results and making amends and doing better over time. <clears throat> I'm gonna pause for a second here in case there are any questions about impact measurement. Does anyone want to get back to that indicator selection now? Do you, how are you, are you feeling better equipped for that? Okay, so before we get into Q&A, I wanted to talk about, we mentioned earlier, integrating sustainability across your enterprise. This is more of a reflective activity. But I want you to remember that, you know, sustainability can have an impact across all sorts of parts of your enterprises. And you, most of you have smaller enterprises right now, so you're able to see that more clearly. But you know, you can think about sustainability. And when I say sustainability, I'm also talking about social impacts in terms of your products and the services that you offer and how you offer them, uh, the different, you know, customer, customer client participant segments, um, looking at the supply chain or value chain, um, those raw materials or resources you can make use of, um, how you distribute 
your products and resources and then how products are disposed of once they've been used. So integrating sustainability into your core business and embedding targets across functions is fundamental towards addressing these goals. So you want to, you want to include sustainability considerations, even when you think about like your, your business development, even when you think about supply chain management, even when you think about the finances, it helps you to um, develop a shared understanding across your team of how progress creates value. Um, you're able to better integrate sustainability goals into performance reviews down the line, if that's important to you. Um, you can think about sustainability in your research and development, your HR, um, and engage in partnerships, right? So partnering with, with your suppliers or um, customers across your value chain in terms of getting on the same page about your values, um, partnering with people, other people in your sector to, to, get, to get on the same page to advance these goals and issues that you're passionate about, or partnerships with different kinds of players to get to the, to the goals that you really want to achieve. Right, you want to make it a key part of your financial, strategic, and operational goals, as well as other areas like sales and productivity. And so for this section in the workbook, you have just a couple of reflection activities. Um, in the workbook, I think it says specifically, like, what is your organizational vision and mission? Um, but you can, you know, turn that however you'd like to. But I'm more, what I think you should really be thinking about more is how does sustainability fit into your core vision and mission? How have you considered sustainability and social impact um, when it comes to, you know, your core operations? How is sustainability involved in that central impact that you want to achieve? Now, I want to carve out some time, a solid 15 minutes, if you'd like, um, to get into some Q&A, you know, so if there are any, any parts of today's session that you'd like me to go back to, um, anything that you're still kind of confused or curious about, or want help with, um, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute and say it out loud. Hi, Alicia. Hello. Um, I was just wondering about um, if you could tell us a bit more about how indicators might change over the course of time. So like I imagine some indicators you might realize um, you really want to report on and you have all the right intentions and you realize it's really hard to get the data or it's not really reflecting what you feel is true or you know is true about your organization's impact. Um, is there any harm or things we should think about when it comes to changing indicators and how often you do that, like whether to add or to take some off? Absolutely, that's a good question. Um, you don't, I think there's only harm if, you, if you're kind of changing your indicator all the time because you can't you know, stick to any, um, under, any clear understanding of your targets or your data. I think in the beginning, it's absolutely fine. You know, as you learn through it, maybe you set a certain indicator and then you're like, oh geez, I can't really get this data clearly often enough and I need to switch things up. And I think you do that whenever you feel like that's, that's needed. Um, but at a certain point, you know, I think 
there's a certain level of uh, knowledge of the organization that that develops over time of the data you have access to that you really get um, comfortable and confident with. And so, you know, if like two, three years down the line, you're still changing indicators and we don't have, you know, some consistent reporting against the same indicators, we have a problem. But, you know, when you're starting out, that's totally fine, you know, move with it, get a feel for it, choose what works for you, and then, and then you're able to really implement it. That being said, if five years later something changes in your business or in your operations and, you know, maybe your targets change or some core feature of your operations change, then yes, change your indicators again. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so like Neelam has put in the chat, um, you can all book one on one if you'd like, if you'd like more private session to talk about your targets and indicator selection, we can absolutely chat for a little bit um, one on one. Um, but if there are any like big picture like ideas or challenges you're anticipating right now, like feel free to, you know, say it out loud or pop it in the chat now while you have like the rest of the participants around us to hear from and give their inputs. Maybe I'll ask another one. Hopefully others yeah. will benefit from this one too. Um, how do you, in, when it comes to stakeholder engagement, I've seen a few different models of like prioritizing stakeholders and understanding how, you know, how significant they are to your organization is maybe how much you should be engaging and should have really good relationships with those stakeholders that you're impacting. And sometimes it's not as black and white, like it gets kind of difficult to, to engage all the possible stakeholders in a meaningful way on a regular basis. And so could you talk a bit about how to maybe some tips or some ideas about how do you go about addressing all of these various stakeholder groups? Sometimes they might even have very different interests, like compared to say like a funder versus your customer, or, you know, they often might be very different in what matters to them. Um, so I just love to hear what you've seen or what you think about how do you sort of reconcile all of the different mm -hmm. perspectives that stakeholders bring to the table. Yeah, that's a key pain point or challenge that a lot of enterprises, no matter how small or early stage or big and late stage they are, um, like you said, you know, different stakeholders often have different and sometimes competing priorities. Um, so how, how are you able to mitigate that? I think when it comes to doing, doing stakeholder in engagement intentionally, you know, you want to scale to the amount that you are capable of holding over time. Um, you don't want to just kind of pop in, you know, ask people to fill out the survey once and then they never hear from you. So you want to be building relationships versus just the sense of, okay, I tapped in and I like asked 10 different types of stakeholders. So I did the job. Like, no, it's about like building relationships with them. It's probably going to be hard and it's impossible to build relationships with all the different types of stakeholders. When it comes to prioritizing, I actually think you should think about the stakeholders who are most likely to see your work in a negative view. Right. And I don't mean that in some sort of like political difference, negative view, but the stakeholders who might feel like your work is negatively impacting them and their lives. Those are the pe some people you need to really talk to and engage with um, and build relationship with um, in terms of your impact. And then after that, obviously, the people who are directly engaged with you, whether those are program participants or customers and clients. How are they feeling? And then everybody else after that. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, so maybe while you'll think of questions, I'm going to open up my Slido outro poll. Um, and let me know how you're feeling. So it's been just over an hour and a half. So 
sorry, yeah, one hour, two hours and a half now. How are you feeling right now in one word? And I do not take offense. If you're tired, if you're overwhelmed, put that down. If you're feeling good and you know empowered, put that down too. Um, yeah, whatever it is you're feeling, no judgment zone. Motivated, I like that one. Excited, ooh, you're like giving me energy. inspired a little stress that's fair nervous but more prepared i'm glad to hear that lots to think about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i hope that some of those more like reflective questions in the workbook helps you like thinking about it and feel free to kind of you know Put it down for a bit and come back to it in a couple of days. So, you know, I think it would be really great to maybe think through some of the workbook activities. Sorry, the lighting in my room is weird now. Some of the workbook activities with some of your teammates. If you do have a team around you, if you're a solopreneur, you know, maybe some of your advisors or current clients or customers. Um, you know, that's that. At, at this very early nascent stage is a great time to get, you know, that stakeholder engagement going because then it even just helps you figure out what you're doing, right? Overwhelmed yet motivated. Yeah, it's, it was a lot, you know, this is a long two and a two plus hours, almost three hours going on here. So I totally get it. It's a lot to process, but I'm glad that you're feeling motivated. And I think I have one more question here. Ah, what's your biggest takeaway from today? Look at the targets, not just the goals. Absolutely. And then don't even or rather translate those targets to make sense for your scale and your context. Just start, I love that. It's big, but it's okay. It's absolutely okay to make it your own. Just as I said, in order to avoid, you know, that greenwashing element, you wanna make sure that when you're looking at a particular goal, you're thinking about how the other goals influence it without centering all 17, because that's a lot. Okay, so we're going to stay open for questions for a minute, um, but in terms of, we just did the slider outro already, um, like I mentioned, you know, go back through the workbook, you know, think about it, think about the reflective questions, talk to some team members or advisors or customers that you have um, while you try to figure pieces out, but book a one-on-one -on -one with me, you know, I'd be happy to sit down one-on-one. -on -one um, just to kind of help you figure out, 
mapping out those goals of targets and indicators, it's a little harder to give you that one-on-one -on -one attention in this group setting. Um, so Sheridan has graciously set this up for us to be able to chat one-on-one, -on -one, and I hope you take advantage of that. I think you have until August 18th um, is the last day of one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, so yeah, feel free to click the link right now in the workbook or in the chat and um, book a time on my calendar or, you know, check back again tomorrow. In the chat. You're very welcome, Kenzie. Oh yeah, like Neelam said, she's gonna be sharing the link with everyone else in Edge tomorrow. So, you know, you wanna if you wanna snag a spot, um, because there are a limited number of spots left. So, you know, feel free to go in and snag a spot as soon as you can. It was my absolute pleasure, Maya. I hope to talk to you one-on-one -on -one maybe. Um, if not, you know, good luck. Feel free to email me anytime. Uh, Danielle, you have your hand up. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, no worries. <laughs> You're very welcome, Ashley. Awesome. I, we're going to wait a while for the questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. But thank you so much, Alicia. This was an amazing, amazing workshop. I have been working with SDGs for quite some time, and this was this was amazing. I loved it. I could see the connection between social enterprises and SDGs, and I hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank um, you so much. For everyone else on the call, uh, please book a one-on-one -on -one with Alicia if you have questions, if you feel like this is a lot of information and you need a few days to digest it. Feel free to book a call um, in the later days if that works best for you. Uh, but I would highly encourage you, especially to those who identify as social ventures, uh, please do book a call and make the most off of it. Um, and we wish you all the best for your work and for your ventures. And at the same time, if you have any questions regards to SDGs or social enterprises, feel free to nudge your point focal person at EDGE. Uh, we'll be more than glad to support you, assist you, or if we are not the right people, then definitely connect you to amazing people like Alicia who would be able to help you out. With that, Umar has- I'm sorry, Neelam, just um, for all of you also, you know, you have first dibs on the one-on-one. -on -one. If for any reason that any of the time slots don't work for your um, schedule, I'll also give you first dibs to send me an email and we can work something out within the next couple of weeks, but nobody else is gonna get that. Um, yeah, go ahead, Neelam. Y'all, you're winning at this right now. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Alicia, for doing that. Um, so everyone, please feel free to utilize that. Feel free to reach out to Alicia on email or book one-on-one. -on -one. And again, if there are any, any concerns, any glitches, if you need any support, feel free to nudge us. Omar has posted a link to the feedback form. Uh, do give us feedback. Give us a shout out if you liked the, if you liked the session. Uh, and connect with us. All of this information will be sent out in a follow-up email. So don't worry if you have missed a link um, or any other information, we'll be sending the recording as well as all of the resources in a follow-up email within one to two days. Thank you so much, everyone. And we're gonna be here for the next few minutes in case if you have questions and if you wanna chat with us. Ashley, did you have any other questions or comments? No, thank you so much. If anything, I will be adding you on LinkedIn right now. So I will thank be you. in touch. I'm Sounds gonna work good. through and see what I come up with and connect.
yeah and book a free one-on-one so we can chat more if you'd like all right thank you so much thank you have a good night you as well Awesome. So it's just the Edge team and Alicia now. Thank you so much, Alicia. It was amazing. I absolutely loved it. I'm so excited for all the one-on-ones that are going to happen. Um, I will be in touch with you in, I think, after 18th. Uh, or maybe, no, not after 18th, on the 11th, just to get a pulse of if people are signing up, because sometimes uh, people lose a track of time. So yeah. it would just be like, it's still 18th. And on the 17th, they would register as the okay. last day left. Um, so we sent out a nudge after a week. So I'll check up, check with you on the 11th again to see how many people have signed up. And then finally, after 18th, I will schedule a call with you to get your feedback and to see how it was. And if you saw anything that was interesting that we should highlight or talk about uh, more. 